I want us to take a break today from our studies on the book of Malachi, and instead, I want us to look at Psalm 110. I decided during last week to do this because I mistakenly thought that it would be the first Sunday of the month today. And I wanted us to focus on the Lord Jesus to prepare us for the Lord's Supper. Well, I was foolishly wrong because today is not the first Sunday of the month and we will not be having yet our Lord's Supper. But I take comfort on the fact that in spite of my mistake, God himself in providence never makes a mistake. So let's turn to Psalm 110. A Psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the Jew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand he will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Many people today are not really clear about what the Lord Jesus is now doing in heaven. What is he doing in heaven? After he died, rose again from the dead on the third day, and ascended into heaven. Many people don't have a clear idea what Christ is now doing in heaven. Now in the book of Acts, we are told that he, that is the risen Christ, was lifted up while they, his disciples, were looking on. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And being now out of our sight, we can no longer see what the Lord Jesus is doing in heaven. But knowing what the Lord Jesus is doing now in heaven is crucial to true biblical Christianity. It is not enough to know that Christ died on the cross, that he rose from the grave on the third day, that he has ascended into heaven. It is vital that we also understand what he is now doing in heaven. What is he doing in heaven? And one text of scriptures that is very helpful to that end is this psalm read in your hearing. This psalm is the most frequently quoted psalm in the New Testament scriptures. It is the psalm that the apostles frequently use in their preaching to explain to others what Christ is now doing in heaven. And what is so amazing about this psalm is that it graphically portrays the events that happened in heaven when Christ ascended into it even before it actually happened in human history. Even before the events actually happened, it is as if David, the writer of the psalm, has been transported in time and space 
by the Holy Spirit to the future and is made to hear and to witness the events that were going to happen in heaven when Jesus would ascend into heaven even before it actually happened. And by the Spirit, David recorded in prophecy the things he saw, the things he heard, of things there were yet future, which he was made to hear and see in prophecy. And they are recorded in this psalm. Now as we look at this psalm, I want you to note that it is divided into two parts. The first part runs from verse 1 to verse 3. And the second part runs from verse 4 to verse 7. And here we have what is called as the AB, AB structure. You have a promise. Then the note of victory is sounded. And then you have a promise. Again, and then a note of victory is sounded. So let us consider the first part of the Messianic Psalm. Note verse 1. The Lord said, or the Lord says to my Lord. So the Lord says to David's Lord, Messiah. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now this is a promise made by God to Messiah of which David in prophecy is made to witness and hear a promise of supreme and universal dominion. To sit at God's right hand is a metaphor of having supreme authority and dominion. God is the supreme being. To sit at his right hand is to have absolute power, dominion, and authority over everything. To make enemies a footstool is an ancient Near Eastern metaphor of complete subjugation. The Lord says to David's Lord, Messiah, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So here we have the Father's express determination to subjugate to Messiah all of his enemies. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemy. His reign begins and that reign continues until every last enemy has been brought into submission. The Messiah. And when was this messianic psalm fulfilled? Well, the Bible is clear at the ascension of Christ. Turn to Acts chapter 2. In Peter's interpretation of this psalm, under the infallible guidance of the Spirit, <laughs> The apostles of Jesus were the official interpreter of the Old Testament scriptures. And notice here what Peter on the day of Pentecost said about the events that were happening. After having referred to many of David's psalms that speaks of Messiah, beginning from verse 25, for David says of him, of Messiah, I saw the Lord always in my presence. He is at my right hand so that 
I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life and will make me full of gladness with your presence. And then here Peter interprets what those psalm refer to. Who is it referring to? Brethren. Verse 29, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. In other words, in those psalm penned by David, he is not speaking of his own experience because David died, David is rotting in the grave and his tomb is still there in Jerusalem up until the time of the preaching of this sermon. So it's not referring to David. Although David penned those words, he was not talking about himself. He was talking of Messiah. Verse 30. And so because he was a prophet, David, and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to sit one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. That he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Spirit the promise or from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. And then he explains notice verse 34 For it was not David who ascended into heaven but he, David himself, says, and then from Psalm 110 verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, that is David's Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom... You crucify. In other words, Peter, under the infallible guidance of the Spirit, said that Psalm 110 was fulfilled at the ascension of Jesus into heaven. It was not David who ascended into heaven. And many of those psalms he wrote were he was not referring to his own experiences, but to the experiences of Messiah, he was writing as a prophet. And it was not David who ascended into heaven. But Messiah, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So even before it actually happened, David already saw what would actually happen. In the spirit. It is as if David has been transported forward in time 1,000 years before the event would happen. He alone of all the biblical writers was permitted to witness what happened when Jesus ascended into heaven. And now Jesus is reigning as God's mediatorial king in fulfillment of what God promised. David, to sit one of his descendants on his throne, this descendant of David, who is also David's Lord. Remember what Jesus said to the Jews, that if Messiah is David's son, how can he be David's Lord? He is both. And so, God fulfilled this prophecy that David records when Jesus ascended to heaven. He sat at the right hand of God and begun his mediatorial reign. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. 
Christ has begun his mediatorial reign. It is not something that will happen yet in our future. It happened when he rose from the grave, never to die again, ascended into glory. The prophecies of the Old Testament about the reign of David's son began. And note that what is further said about Messiah's kingship in verses 2 to 3 of Psalm 110. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the Jew. Note here first, Messiah's rule will be from Zion. In verse 2, rule, the Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion. A symbol of the authority of a king. And where is this king reigning? Zion. Saying rule in the midst of your enemies. And where is Zion? Well obviously Zion here refers not to earthly Zion. Zion on earth. But to heavenly Zion. The place of God's special presence. Of which the earthly Zion at the time of David was only a shadow. And this is clear from the passage already quoted earlier in Acts 2.34. It was not David who ascended into heaven, heavenly Zion, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet. So David was not referring to earthly Zion. David was referring to heavenly Zion, of which earthly Zion was just a shadow. And Messiah, as king, as God's mediatorial king, who began his reign when he ascended into heaven, where is the center of his throne, of his kingship? Zion, heavenly Zion, of which the earthly Zion was just a picture, a shadow. And second, Things said about Messiah's kingship here in these verses is that Messiah's kingship and rule will extend to his enemies' territory. Verse 2 of Psalm 110. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, heavenly Zion, saying, Rule. In the midst of your enemies. He will rule in the midst of their enemies. Although Messiah will rule from Zion, heavenly Zion, yet he will rule even in the midst of his enemies on earth. Even while the enemies are raging and opposing and rebelling, his rule and kingship does not, that does not change the fact that Messiah rules and he rules even in the midst of his enemies. We find an expansion of this prophecy in Psalm chapter 2. In Psalm 2, which is another messianic psalm. If you turn there for a moment. In Psalm 2. And notice again how this psalm is interpreted in the New Testament. Why are the nations 
in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed Christ saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast their cords from us. And notice how God responds to this rebellion. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. And then Messiah speak. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with the rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthen wares. Now, notice here the picture is that the nations are in rebellion against God and God's appointed mediatorial king. They are rebelling against him. They don't want to be subject to God and subject to God's appointed king. Let us tear their fetters apart, cast their cords from us. But in spite of human rebellion against God and against his appointed king, the Lord simply laughs. And says, you cannot frustrate my purpose. I have installed my king. In spite of your rebellion, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mount. Heavenly Zion. And notice how the church interpreted that psalm in Acts chapter 4 and verse 23. Christ died, rose again, ascended into heaven, and the disciples preached and proclaimed the gospel. But the church was persecuted by the world. In fact, the leaders of the church were persecuted by the Jewish authorities. And we read in verse 23 of Acts 4, when they had released them, when they had been released, that is the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, the apostles, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders of the Jews had said to them. When they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant said. And then the psalm, that psalm too. Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, his anointed. And then verse 27, For truly in this city, Jerusalem, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. You see how the church interpreted that psalm? It came to its hedge when Christ came in the city of Jerusalem and the Jews and the Gentiles rejected him, had him crucified. But he who sits in the heaven laughs. Nobody can frustrate what he has predestined to occur. What they did was in full accord with what God predestined to occur. He has installed his king on heavenly Zion. So, 
Messiah is promised universal and supreme dominion. He rules in heavenly Zion. His rule extends to his enemy's territory. Rule in the midst of your enemies. And then the third thing about Messiah's rule here in this psalm, in Psalm 110, is that Messiah's rule is so powerful that he will recruit his own people from among his own enemies. Verse 3. Your people. This is the Lord saying to David's Lord. Your people will volunteer freely or will be made willing in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the Jew. Your people will volunteer freely or will be made willing in the day of your power. The picture here is that Messiah is gathering a people to himself, a volunteer army. And this volunteer army, Messiah recruits from his very enemy. That's how powerful Messiah is as he reigns, even in the midst of his enemy. He recruits his own people from among his enemies. To better the words of another, Messiah has entered the very camp of the enemy. From the veritable ranks of the armies of his hostile enemies, the Son of God recruits his own people. Not a few are enrolled in his ranks from the very gates of hell. They are numerous as the drops of dew at daybreak. They come from every nation, tribe, and people. Each follower of the Lamb, one share the hatred of Messiah's person and rule. Once eagerly rebelled against his law and throne. But now they are arrayed in shining purity like the glistening dew of the early dawn. Such is the greatness of Messiah's might that none had been forced into his service. The army of Christ has never conscripted its truth that is forced people to join the army of Christ. Each one has been mysteriously made willing in the depths of his being. Rebels who hated the rule of God and Messiah, who sought to suppress the truth, who rebelled against Messiah, are mysteriously made willing in the depths of their being to volunteer and be part of Messiah's people. His army. Now, of course, a classic example of this is Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul. He was a he was formerly a blasphemer, a violent aggressor who tortured Christians, wanting them to recant their faith in Christ. He wanted to turn churches into rubbles. But the Lord appeared to him on the road of Damascus and turned him completely around, making him willing in the day of his power and became one of the greatest generals in the Lord's army. And if you read church history, that happens over and over again. Augustine, the wayward genius, a hater of God, an immoral man, 
who believe that God is both good and evil, the yin and the yang, that there is really no morality because evil is part of God and good is part of God. He indulge himself in the desires of his flesh until God completely turn him around. And so was Luther, who was a priest of the Roman Church. It's idolatrous worship. Calvin, Zwingli, and a host of many others. They were all from the enemy's camp, made willing. In the day of Messiah's power. Well, that is the first part of this messianic song. But then let's consider the second part of the messianic song. And the second part again begins with a promise. Verse 4. Of Psalm 110. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The psalmist resumes quoting the Lord's word to David's Lord. And here we have an oath God makes to Messiah. An oath that God said he will never revoke. The Lord has sworn and will never change his mind. It's a covenant he makes with Messiah. And here we see that Messiah will be a priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek. He will not only be a priest with a universal supreme dominion reigning in the midst of God's enemy. Reigning until everyone will be subjugated. Reigning as one so powerful that he recruits his own people from the enemy's territory. He is more than just a king. He is promised a permanent priesthood. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So he will be a kingly priest or a priestly king. And why does Messiah have to be both king and priest? Well, the answer is not that hard to find. All who become part of the people of Messiah made willing in the day of his power are still sinful and therefore in need of a priest a mediator remember that all of them once were rebels against God were enemies against God and against Messiah they are recruited from the enemies camp they once were rebels but Messiah made them willing in the day of his power Moreover, remember that even the most faithful people of Messiah are still sinful. And none of them can live a perfectly righteous and holy life before God. Thus, in Psalm 143 verse 2, you remember the prayer of David, the servant of God. He says, do not enter into judgment with your servant. God's servant. For in your sight, no man living is righteous. He was God's servant. He was a man after God's own heart. And yet David says, do not enter into judgment with me. Do not judge me according to the strictness of your justice. For if you will do that, no man living can stand for no one in your sight who is living is perfectly righteous. Also in Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 20, Solomon under the infallible guidance of the Spirit said, There is not a righteous man on earth 
who, consist, who continually does good and who never sins. He says, there is not such a man. There, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. In other words, even the righteous are not perfectly righteous. They are not perfectly consistent. Although they are righteous and want to live a righteous life by the grace and power of God, they do not consistently live that way. And John says in 1 John 1, 8, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. And John as an apostle, as a servant in the Lord's army, as part of Messiah's people, includes himself in that. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Therefore, all of the people of Messiah, all the servants of Messiah, do not just need a king. To rule over them, but also a priest. Messiah has to be both king and priest. And when the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven, he did not only begun his powerful reign in heavenly Zion. His rule extending into his enemy's territory, recruiting from even among his enemies a people made willing in the day of his power. But also when Jesus ascended into heaven, God swears to him with an oath. Not only that, as a king, he will have supreme and universal dominion, but also that he will have a permanent priesthood. He will be priest forever. The exposition of this promise is found particularly in the book of Hebrews. Let us look at some of those texts. And we find this psalm, Quoted several times in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5. And verse 1. And following. For every high priest is contrasting the Levitical priesthood under the old covenant from Christ's high priesthood under the new covenant. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. He, the priest, can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he, the priest under the old covenant, himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sin. And for the people, so also for himself. And no one takes the honor to himself but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest. But he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with cloud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. And having been made perfect, when he rose from the grave, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. 
being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Made perfect. Made perfect in a sense that he had learned obedience through suffering. Made perfect in a sense that not that he once was disobedient and then learned obedience in a sense of no longer being disobedient. But as the demands of obedience increase, he experiencedly learned obedience. And through the suffering, he had to experience an obedience in those demands. As the God-man, he has reached that state of being a perfectly fit high priest. When he rose from the grave, ascended into heaven, and the Father swore to him with an oath, you are a priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek. So if you're wondering what Jesus is doing now in heaven. He's reigning as king. He is ministering as priest forever. Hebrews 6 verse 17. Okay. In the same way God. Desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, heaven, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. When he went into heaven, he went there to serve as priests. Forever. In Hebrews 7, verse 11. Verse 11. As the writer explains and expands on this. Now, if perfection was through the Levitical priests, the old covenant priesthood, the priesthood instituted by God during the time of Moses, now, if perfection was through the Levitical priests, on the basis of it, the people received the law. What further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also, the law that regulates worship. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, not Levi, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. And this is clearer still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is attested of him you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. What was the order under the old covenant? To become a high priest. You have to be a descendant of Aaron. You have not only to be a part of the tribe of Levi. But you have to be a son. A descendant of Aaron. That was the law of physical requirement. But on what basis is Jesus made priest forever? On the basis of an indestructible life. He died, rose again, never to die again. 
And it is on the basis of that reality that God swore to him with an oath. You are a priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek. Okay? And notice further in verse 18 of Hebrews 7. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment, the old covenant physical requirement of a priest, because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect, the old covenant. On the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God, inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for they indeed became priests, the Levitical priests, without an oath, but he with an oath to the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. So much the more also Jesus has become a guarantee of a better covenant. The former priests, the Levitical priests, on the one hand existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the one hand, because he continues forever, he will never die again, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He is priest forever on the basis of an indestructible life. When he died, rose again. He will never die again. He has been made perfect forever. And the Lord sworn to him with an oath. Not only that he will be king and reign as king until all his enemies are subjugated. But also that he will be priest forever. And he began that powerful reign as king and priest when he ascended into heaven. The Lord swore to him. And what is interesting is that David, long before it happened, had been made to hear and witness long before it happened. What was going to happen? And then turn to Hebrews chapter 8. Just one more text. In connection to this. Hebrews 8 verse 1. Oh, the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty. Where? In the heavens. This priest is also a king. He sits on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And then verse 2. A minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, not man. For every high priest under the old covenant is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it is necessary that this high priest has also something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Since they are those who offer the gifts according to the law, the old covenant, who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly thing. Just as Moses was warned by God when he's about to erect the temple, for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. But now he, Messiah, has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. The true tabernacle in heaven. The old covenant was only a shadow of a reality that was yet to unfold in the future. The earthly tabernacle was a picture of the true tabernacle in heaven. 
The priesthood under the old covenant only foreshadows the priesthood of Christ. And when came Christ came, he entered into the Turu tabernacle in heaven to begin his reign as king, as well as his service in the sanctuary as priest forever. These realities were foreshadowed even during the time of David. Remember David? David's throne was where? In Zion, in Jerusalem, earthly Zion. And you remember as king, he brought the tabernacle to Jerusalem because he wanted the place of worship the center of the place of worship to be in the city where David reigns as king. And later on, the tabernacle was enlarged to a temple, but all of those were merely shadows. So Jerusalem, Mount Zion, became the place of, the central place of worship where God's special presence was in the tabernacle and then in the temple and it was also the seat of David's kingship. The same is true now of Messiah. He reigns in heavenly Zion and also minister as priest in heavenly Zion. And later, heavenly Zion or heavenly Jerusalem will come down on earth at the second coming of Christ. So the Lord promised him not only to make him king with universal supreme dominion, but the Father sworn to him with an oath when he ascended into heaven. To be priests forever. And then note what is further said about Messiah's kingly priesthood in Psalm 110 verses 5 to 7. And here the theme of victory resumes. In verse 5. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Here, the theme, as I have said, of victory resumes. It portrays Messiah's final assault on his enemies and his complete victory over them. None of his enemies will be left standing. And this, is, and this will happen only at the second coming of Christ. When Messiah comes again in glory, he will completely destroy all those who are his enemies. He will completely destroy all those who rebel against him. He is now ruling in their midst, but he is going to subjugate and destroy all those who rebel against him and who oppose him. And they will all be destroyed and Messiah will gain complete victory over his enemies and God's enemies. None will be left standing who opposed him. And the book of Revelations makes it clear that at, that at that particular time God will recreate the heavens and the earth and heavenly Zion will be reunited with the recreated and perfected Messiah will reign forever 
as king and priest in the recreated earth. So this is what the Lord is now doing in heaven. He is reigning as king in heavenly Zion. And reigning even in the midst of his enemies. Even though people in the earth are rebelling against him. That does not mean that Messiah is not now reigning. He is reigning as king. And the rebellion of the people is not going to frustrate what God has planned and purpose and predestined to occur. He is reigning even in the midst of his enemies, recruiting his own people from the enemy's territory. And this king is also serving now as priest in heaven forever. Because his people are still sinful. And his people are still in need of his priestly work. And his priestly work is a permanent one. He will not delegate it to someone else. He is priest forever. He will never grow old. He will never die. He is a priest forever. So in the light of this, let me ask you, is Jesus Christ your king? Do you acknowledge and submit to his kingship? His rule over you in providence. His rule over his people through his word. Do you acknowledge him as king? ruling in the midst of the enemy, guiding the events of providence and dictating to his servants in his word as to what he requires of you. Is he your king? Do you acknowledge and submit to his kingship? Are you on his side or not? You see, the only real safe place to be is to be on his side. And remember that there is no middle ground here. The Lord made it clear in Matthew 12, 30, He who is not with me is against me. Either you are for him or you are against him. You cannot say no. I'm in between. You can't. You're either with him or you're against him. If you don't acknowledge his kingship and submit to his kingship and live by his laws and trust in his providences as king, then you are not on his side. You're against him. And my friend, if you take that side, you're a fool. You're a fool. Nobody will ever win against him. It's a no-win situation. If you're against him, you'll never win. But how can I be safe on Jesus' side when I am still sinful? Well, remember that he who is king is also a priest forever. And he offered that one sacrifice for sin for all time when he died on Calvary as the just basis of the forgiveness of sins for those whom he came to save and to those who are on his side. And he continually intercedes for his people on the basis of that blood shed on Calvary to ensure their preservation and their complete and ultimate salvation. He is priest forever.
So be on the side of this priestly king and kingly priest. You can't see him. You have to live by faith, not by sight. But he is reigning as king now. In the midst of his enemies. And he is ministering as priest. You want forgiveness? Go to him. You want help in the midst of your struggles with sin? Go to him. He is priest forever. Be on the side of this kingly priest. And this priestly king. And for you to say, ah, I don't believe those stuff. What do you believe? And where will that belief take you? Where will it take you?